Dear son, you must understand that your home is not here where you have been born, for you are a warrior. You are a bird, and this house where you have just been born is only a nest. Your mission is to give the sun the blood of enemies to drink, and to feed the earth with their bodies. In the time of Columbus, Europe discovered a strange new world, where every boy was born to fight, and men fought for living flesh. Mortals to be sacrificed to slake the thirst of a god for blood. On a bright, warm day in the autumn of 1519, Spanish conquistadors rode down into the valley of the shadow of death. They feared no evil because they saw none, only greening pastures and shimmering still waters and a city afloat, Tenochtitlan, capital of the mighty kingdom of the Aztecs. These great pyramids and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like an enchanted vision. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all a dream. Riding eight abreast down a long causeway, a few hundred foreigners entered a city of 200,000, larger than any in Spain. They stopped at the steps of a temple a hundred feet high, washed in sunlight and stained with infamy. The shrine was so caked with blood and the floor so bathed in it that the stench was worse than that of any slaughterhouse in Spain. They beat the drum and the sound was most dismal, like some music from hell. There were many diabolical objects and large knives and many hearts that had been burnt before their idols. From the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean, the Aztecs ruled an empire built on trade, tribute, and terror. But they were awed by the men with white skin and dark beards from a land beyond the sea who carried sticks that belched fire and who might be gods. Scarcely 200 years before the Spanish arrived, the Aztecs entered the Valley of Mexico and settled at the center of vast Lake Texcoco. 
by sinking logs into the soft ground and raising platforms over the marshes, they built up their great capital, Tenochtitlan. Lacking natural wealth, the city grew rich on trade. Life revolved around its thriving markets. As the Aztecs multiplied, so did their power. Tenochtitlan, built upon mud, gained a second foundation, tribute in goods and flesh, exacted from its weaker neighbors by its powerful army. For a boy, to be born an Aztec was to be born a warrior. When he came into the world, the midwife sprinkled water across his mouth and chest and held him up to the gods. One day, she chanted, he would enter the palace of delights where the brave who die in battle rejoice. The boy's life would be dedicated to Huitzilopochtli, god of the sun and of war. He was the model for every warrior. Each night, the sun god fought furiously with the moon and the stars. At dawn, victorious, he rose again and crops flourished. But the nightly battle so exhausted him that he craved the precious water, human blood. When the Aztecs dedicated their shrine to the sun god, they wallowed for days in an orgy of sacrifice. Their victims numbered in untold thousands. War must always continue, so that whenever our god wishes to eat and feast, we may go there as one who goes to a market to buy something to eat, to obtain victims to offer our god Huitzilopochtli. For the Aztecs, warfare was their lifeblood. Leaving childhood, a boy entered a house of youth to begin his training. Priests scarred his torso and arms with the marks of the sun god and taught him the ballads glorifying fallen heroes. The brave warriors and all the youths each day, each night, should sing and dance so that all the cities which lay about Mexico should hear. At 15, the boy learned the tools of his profession, the bow and the sling, the javelin and the shield, but foremost, the club. It was studded with blades of obsidian, razor sharp and harder than steel. Such a weapon could sever a man's head with one blow. The boy learned how to live through battle and how to die nobly. He was not to fear death, but should even welcome it. The slain warrior would be borne away on tinted clouds to live honorably among the gods. He who survived and excelled could expect lavish rewards on earth. At 18, the boy was at last allowed to watch seasoned warriors in combat. With his second venture onto the battlefield came his first test. He and five other youths must take a prisoner. If they succeeded, they tore out his heart and offered it, still beating, to the gods. Then they feasted upon his body. The first captor was rewarded with the torso and right thigh. The sixth contented himself with the left forearm.
Taking a second prisoner brought the young man new privileges and higher rank. A third gave him command of junior warriors and the right to dance and drink spirits at festivals. A fourth captive made him a fully-fledged warrior. A fifth won him distinction in dress. After taking six captives, he joined the exalted ranks from whom officers and generals were chosen. However low a warrior's birth, glory in battle opened the way to noble rank and untold wealth. The king of the Aztecs fought beside his soldiers, wearing the most resplendent feathered headdress, but braving the same dangers. His authority rested upon his courage. A warrior's time in the sun could be brief. If fortune failed to shine upon him, no matter his rank, he returned to work as a fisherman, farmer, or sandal maker. But another summer brought another campaign and one more chance for glory. Insatiable for tribute, the Aztecs warred incessantly with other tribes. Before fielding their army, they sent out their spies. When they entered land under which they were at war, they became like their enemies, in their garments, their hairdress, their speech. If they were discovered, they were slain South of Tenochtitlan, a party of Aztec spies entered a Mistec city, renowned for its gold, feathers, and precious jewels. Unmasked, the spies were seized and publicly flogged. When he learned of this affront, the Aztec emperor Moctezuma vowed revenge. From each ward within Tenochtitlan, he requisitioned food, arms, and equipment to provision tens of thousands of warriors. Lacking the wheel and beasts of burden, they were followed by just as many porters. Priests carrying effigies of the gods marched ahead behind raiding parties and scouts who relayed messages to the main body with conch shells. Days later, outside the Mistec city, the two enemies met. The battle followed all the rituals of a performance. Generals in brilliant...